This unit is fluid flow, page 95, and we're going to begin by reviewing some of the units that we are familiar with from the pressure unit and introduce a few more units we'll be using in this chapter. So recall that the gravitational constant is 9.81 newtons per kilogram or meters per second squared. In the CGS system, it's 981 dynes per gram, or 981 centimeters per second squared. In the British system, it's 32.2 pounds of force per slug, or 32.2 feet per second squared. And there's a couple other units here that we won't deal with at this time. Recall in our unit on pressure, we began by looking at the density of water in various units. So let's quickly remind ourselves that the density of water at 4 degrees C, where it is densest, is 1 gram per cubic centimeter, or 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, or 1.9403 slugs per cubic foot, or 62.43 pounds per cubic foot. Using weight density as a starting point, we determined 981 dynes per cubic centimeter, or 9807 newtons per cubic meter. And again, we have 62.43 pounds per cubic foot, and we won't deal with poundals. Some volume units that we'll need for this chapter. One imperial gallon is 4.546 liters, whereas a U.S. gallon is 3.785 liters. If you take a ratio of these two values, you'll find that one imperial gallon is 1.2 U.S. gallons considerably larger, isn't it? If you start with an imperial gallon, and we'll say it's 4.546 liters, and convert that to mass in kilograms and then in pounds, we find that one imperial gallon is 10.02 pounds per imperial gallon. That's a unit we'll be using in this chapter. One U.S. gallon is 8.345 pounds per U.S. gallon. Starting from the density of water, we can calculate that there are 6.23 imperial gallons per cubic foot. And again, we can write 7.48 U.S. gallons per cubic foot. Recall that power is work per unit time. Work is force times displacement per unit time. Therefore, power has units of newtons times meters per second. And a newton times a meter is a joule, so power is joules per second, and the unit for that is watts. In the British system, that would be force times displacement over time is simply foot-pounds per second, or pounds-feet per second. It's said both ways. Power can also be calculated as P times Q. It's not intuitive, but if you look at the units, it does work. Since pressure is newtons per square meter, and flow rate, volumetric flow rate, is cubic meters per second, if we cancel meters squared from the denominator, we're left with newtons times meters per second. And that is, as we see here, that's power, force times displacement over time. In the British system, that would be pounds times feet per second, or foot-pounds per second, again, as we saw above. We have a larger unit for power called the horsepower. The horsepower is 746 watts. It's 550 foot-pounds per second, or 33,000 foot-pounds per minute. All right, so page 96, please. On page 96, we get to do our first calculation involving fluid flow. So when an incompressible fluid flows through a pipe, now an incompressible fluid would be a liquid. Gases are very much compressible, but generally speaking, liquids, for the most part, are pretty much incompressible, unless you're referring to extremely high pressures, and even then, the amount of volume reduction is pretty much negligible for most calculation purposes. So when an incompressible fluid flows through a pipe at a steady flow rate, the quantity 
of flow past all points is constant. That's really important. So if you have so many gallons a minute of liquid going into a pipe, then you have to have the same number of gallons per minute coming out of the pipe unless there's another pipe from which it is draining or from which is being added. Consider a pipe, a circuit of pipe whose cross-sectional area would be pi d squared over 4. Consider the length of a section of the fluid. We'll just call it this length d has moved that distance per unit time. From that we have a definition for flow rate. Volumetric flow rate is volume over time. And volume can be calculated as cross-sectional area times its displacement or length per unit time that it moves. And since d over t, distance over time, its velocity, we can therefore write Q is equal to A times V. Let me just highlight it again here. Q is equal to A times V. So volumetric flow rate Q is the volume of liquid passing a certain point per unit time. So we have units of cubic meters per hour, liters per minute, milliliters per second, cubic feet per second, gallons per hour, and a variety of other units. We want to be careful not to confuse capital V, which we use for volume, with lowercase v, which we use for velocity. And again, keep in mind it's often easier to calculate a cross-sectional area as pi d squared over 4 rather than pi r squared. Why is it easier? Well, because usually dimensions of pipes are given in diameters rather than radius. Right, so problem number one here. The nozzle of a garden hose has an internal diameter, ID is internal diameter, of 0.5 inches. If water flows through the hose at 10 US gallons per minute, that's volumetric flow rate, Q, find the speed at which it leaves the nozzle in feet per second. Let's talk about internal diameter for a moment. This would represent the cross-section of a pipe, or in this example, a garden hose. And important dimensions are the outside diameter and then the inside diameter. Now we're always interested in the inside diameter because that is the cross-sectional diameter of the fluid we're discussing. But oftentimes in pipe tables, we're given outside diameter and the wall thickness from which we have to calculate the inside diameter. So note that the internal diameter would be equal to the outside diameter minus two wall thicknesses, and there it is there. Outside diameter minus two wall thicknesses would give us the inside diameter. In this problem, we're given the inside diameter, so we don't need to calculate it. So our basic formula for volumetric flow is Q is equal to A times V. where V is velocity. In this problem, we're asked to solve for velocity in feet per second, so we'll have to rearrange this. We'll say V is equal to Q over A. Now both flow and area would need to be in units of cubic feet per second and square feet. We have to convert both of these. Let's get the area first. The area is calculated as pi d squared over 4. Now the diameter is given as 0.5 inches, the internal diameter. We want to convert that to feet. And you no doubt are aware there's 12 inches per foot. And that'll be squared over 4. And for that I get 0 0.001364 square feet. For the flow rate, Q, well, Q is given as 10 US gallons per minute. We need to convert that to cubic feet per second. Well, Let's take care of the time first. That's pretty easy. We'll cancel out per minutes and go to per second. We know there's 60 seconds in a minute. So if you think about it, there'll be less volume of liquid moved in a second than in a minute, which is why we're dividing this number by 60. 
and then finally we have to convert from US gallons to cubic feet. Now we had a conversion factor for that given on page 95. I'm going to jump back there and take a look. We want US gallons to cubic feet. 7.48 US gallons per cubic foot. So one cubic foot, 7.48 US gallons. Minutes cancel, gallons cancel. We're left with cubic feet per second. 0 0.0223 cubic feet per second. So we'll put these in our equation for velocity. 0 0.0223 cubic feet per second divided by an area of 0 0.001364 square feet. And so square feet cancel some of the feet in the numerator and we're left with feet per second as a unit and that's 16.3 feet per second is the velocity of the liquid leaving the hose. Please take a look at page 97. The continuity equation or steady state flow equation. So here we have a liquid, a non-compressible fluid that's traveling through a pipe from a point where the cross-sectional area is larger moving to a point where the cross-sectional area is smaller from 2 to 1. We know that liquids are non-compressible so if we have a flow rate of say 10 gallons per second at point 2 we're still going to have a flow rate of 10 gallons per second at point 1 unless there's a leak in the pipe or something's being added to it. Flow rate is constant. So if the cross-sectional area decreases, what must velocity do to keep the flow rate constant? The velocity must increase. Have you ever paddled a canoe or a boat, a kayak, down a river and notice that as the river narrows, it speeds up? Notice the rapids. That's the inverse relationship between area and velocity for constant flow. Or you could say diameter and velocity for constant flow. So this is an inverse relationship. We've studied them before. For example, consider the inverse relationship between pressure of a gas and volume of a gas. This is for gases. And we'll fix the temperature at constant temperature and number of moles. We'll fix that too. What happens as the pressure increases? We know the volume is decreased. It's compressed. We have the same situation for flow of liquids. So this is for liquid flow. constant flow rate. If the area changes, how does that affect the velocity? It's inverse. If the area increases, the velocity decreases. If the area decreases, then the velocity increases. Constant flow rate. The area is decreasing from 2 to 1. The velocity must be increasing. So we can work with velocity and area inversely, but we can extend it further and talk about diameter. Take a look at this ratio. This is area 1 over area 2. We know that area can be written as pi d squared over 4. So I'll write this area 1 as pi d 1 squared over 4. Area 2 is pi d 2 squared over 4. Pi and d are constants, so they can be cancelled. So then we know that the ratio of areas is equivalent to the ratio of diameter squared. I'll factor out the squared and here we have it. So A1 over A2 is equivalent to D1 over D2 squared or I can write that as radius 1 over radius 2 squared. So we can relate velocity and area. We can also relate velocity and diameter squared.
note that velocity is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area and thus also to the square of the radius or diameter of the pipe. The larger the pipe, the lower the velocity for a given flow rate. And this equation of continuity holds for incompressible, non-compressible fluids, and those would be liquids. And that's in any direction, up or down or back or forth. Let's try problem number two. We have water in a pipe with a 12 centimeter diameter, that's D1, is flowing with a velocity of 8 meters per second, there's V1. Calculate the velocity, V2, at a point in the pipe where its diameter is constricted to 3 centimeters. So as much as possible I'm going to try and avoid the use of formulas and rather I'll try and think these through and I would hope you'll follow with me as I do that. I'm going to say that V2, which I want to solve for, is equal to V1 times some ratio of the diameters and we've learned that it's the diameter squared. Now let's just make sense of it. If the diameter is decreasing from position 1 to position 2, what's happening to the velocity? Well, it's increasing by a ratio of diameter squared. How do we make velocity 1 get bigger? We'll put the big number over the small number. So V2 is equal to V1, which is 8 meters per second, times the ratio of diameters that makes it get larger. Let's put the larger diameter, 12 centimeters, over the smaller diameter, 3 centimeters. And we'll square that. That's 12 over 3 is 4. 4 squared is 16. V2 will be 8 meters per second times 16. The units of diameter cancel and that's equal to 128 meters per second. So notice I didn't use a formula per se, I just thought it through that the velocity in the narrow section V2 must be greater than the velocity in V1 so I put the larger diameter over the small one and squared it and I didn't actually write a true formula and I would encourage you not to not to write formulas just think it through and you'll get it right each time if you relegate yourself to formulas it's not a good friend it'll betray you when you need it most it'll betray you on tests because we do it autonomically without thinking we just put them in get numbers and we have no thought process really it makes sense the velocity has to increase so make sure you put the larger diameter over the small diameter before you square it page 99 Bernoulli's equation take a look at this diagram as I explain this when a liquid flows through a pipe and enters a region where the pipe diameter is reduced we learn that the speed increases because the flow rate is constant the continuity equation now a change in speed involves acceleration right which means that a net force must be acting on the fluid. Remember your basic physics? Force equals mass times acceleration. And so acceleration is force over mass. Now if the mass is constant and the liquid speeds up, that means the acceleration has increased and so the force must increase. Where does that force come from? This force can only arise from a difference in pressure between the different parts of the pipe. So where must the pressure be higher? If the liquid is accelerating from right to left here, the pressure on the right must be greater than the pressure on the left. Obviously, the pressure in the section of pipe where the diameter is larger must be greater since the liquid increases in speed as it enters the constriction. By similar reasoning, the pressure must be lower in the constriction where the speed is greater. Now, I think this sounds counterintuitive. If you ever played with a garden hose, you know that if the velocity of the liquid coming out of the garden hose is low, it just kind of splashes against your skin. But if you turn it up high, uh, you feel the impact, you feel the, feel the force, so 
you would think, well, there must be greater pressure when it's moving faster. But that pressure you feel is the pressure created by the velocity of the liquid stopping, going to zero as it hits your skin, and that kinetic energy that stops has to transfer to some other form of energy, and so you feel pressure. But that is not the pressure that's in the liquid itself. We can measure the pressure in the moving liquid with a manometer, and we're going to do this this semester in some of our labs. You will see when we connect a pressure gauge to the wide section of pipe, you'll see the pressure is greater in the fluid than in the narrow section of pipe. Let me explain it a different way. I'll argue again here. So ignoring friction or change in elevation or heat transfer or chemical reaction or any other external factor, ignoring all that, the total mechanical energy of a liquid remains constant. It's much like the law of inertia. An object will continue to move at constant velocity unless acted upon by some external force. As a pipe constricts, its velocity increases, so its kinetic energy is increasing. Now you can't get energy for nothing. The velocity or kinetic energy increases at the expense of some other form of energy, and that energy is pressure. As the velocity increases, from in this diagram from 2 to 1, then its pressure must decrease from 2 to 1. Daniel Bernoulli, a Swiss mathematician and physicist, derived an equation, it's called Bernoulli's equation, that describes the total mechanical energy in a fluid. I want to write it out here in bare bones form, and then we'll look at some of the more specific forms of it. The total mechanical energy is the sum of three terms. The pressure, and I'll say pressure at point one, plus potential energy, that's a form of energy too, potential energy at point one, plus the kinetic energy at point one, that must be equal to the total mechanical energy at any other point in the system neglecting friction. That would be equal to the pressure at point 2 plus the potential energy at point 2 plus the kinetic energy at point 2 again neglecting or ignoring friction. So if the total energy is constant, if left side equals right side, then a fluid flowing from right to left that's gaining kinetic energy must also be losing energy, namely pressure energy. Bernoulli's equation has a variety of forms in order to add these three terms together, pressure and elevational potential energy and kinetic energy, we have to have the same unit for each term. We can't combine a pressure term with kinetic energy unless the units are the same. And so by multiplying all terms in the equation by various constants, Bernoulli came up with forms of the equation in which all the units are constant and these can be added together. So this is one of the forms of Bernoulli's equation. We have a pressure term, and that would be in units of pressure. We have the elevational potential energy, rho times g times z, z being the elevation in height, meters or feet. But when multiplied by rho and g, it actually has units of pressure, force per unit area. And then we have the kinetic energy term, one half rho v one squared. and by multiplying by rho and squaring, we have units which are in terms of pressure and we have not changed the equality of the equation because the same constant has been multiplied by all terms. Before we leave this page, I want to point out to you that there are some links on Blackboard to some excellent, very short animations that help you visualize Bernoulli's equation and you really should watch those. Page 100, please. On page 100, we have Bernoulli's equation in five different forms, and that continues on to page 101, and there's actually six forms. In each case, each equation is Bernoulli's equation, but what's been done is we multiplied all the terms by some constant, so the, the equality is still valid, but they have different units. For example, here's one form of Bernoulli's equation in which all units are in newton meters or pounds feet. Here's a second form. One of the common ones we'll use, and we'll start with this, is pressure as P, 
elevational potential energy as rho g z and kinetic energy as one half rho v squared and in this form all terms you'll see have units of pressure newtons per square meter pounds per square foot or dynes per square centimeter number four is another form number five is a uh, actually even an easier form that we'll use in just a little bit pressure term is denoted H, H being the height of a liquid that would produce a certain pressure, Z being the elevation of the liquid at some point, that's its potential energy, and the velocity term is V squared over 2G. In this form of Bernoulli's equation you'll find that all the units are in terms of height such as feet or meters. On page 101 there's a sixth form of Bernoulli's equation and finally Equation number seven is actually equation number five again, but this time we've added a term for the pressure added by a pump, which is used to offset the loss in pressure due to friction. And we'll get to this one a little bit later. So for right now, we're going to use equations three and five, and they're most commonly used for Bernoulli's equation. Let's get some practice with some of these. Page 102. Page 102, let's look at some special cases of Bernoulli's equation before we deal with the full equation. There's a number of cases where the pressure or height or the speed term of a liquid in the system is constant and therefore simplified forms of Bernoulli's equation result and we'll look at some of those first. Let's say the liquid is not moving. If liquid is at rest, then the velocity term would cancel and we'd be left with this form. We can say pressure P1 plus potential energy rho GZ1 at some point will be equal to pressure plus rho GZ2 at some other point. I can collect some terms. I'll say P2 minus P1, we'll call that difference in pressure, is equal to rho gz1 minus rho gz2. Or I can simply say delta p is equal to rho g delta z. Alright, let's give it a try. The gauge pressure of water standing in a vertical pipe is 0.2 atmospheres at a certain depth. Calculate the gauge pressure in water in inches of water at a point that's two meters higher. Alright, so I've drawn a picture of this and let me read it again as I show you the picture. So the gauge pressure of water standing in a vertical pipe, here's water in a vertical pipe, is 0.2 atmospheres at a certain depth. Calculate the gauge pressure in the water in inches of water at a point that is two meters higher. So this point is two meters higher. What's the pressure going to be up here? It's going to be less, of course, because there's less depth of water above that point. Let's use Bernoulli's equation and calculate delta P is equal to rho G times delta H, difference in height. So delta P equals rho G delta H an abbreviated form of Bernoulli's equation is actually the pressure depth equation. So delta P okay so mass density we're going to work in the SI system 1000 kilograms per cubic meter the gravitational constant in the SI system 9.807 newtons per kilogram and the height difference here is two meters. You work this out, it's 19,600 newtons per square meter, right? So kilograms are gone, cancel meters with cubic meters and get square meters. And those are pascals. I want to convert those to atmospheres easiest way is to use atmospheric pressure as the conversion factor, one atmosphere 
is 101,325 pascals. This works out to be a very small number, 0.1936 atmospheres. Now, bear in mind that 2 meters is not a great depth in terms of pressure change. So, the pressure is 0.2 atmospheres at this lower point, and it's different by 0.1936 atmospheres up here. Let's calculate what the pressure is then at the higher level. So at this point here, the pressure will be equal to 0.2 atmospheres minus that pressure difference of 0.1936. You see why I kept all the decimals, because it's going to be a very small number. 0.0 zero six four atmospheres is all the pressure that's left at that higher elevation. Now we're asked to calculate that as inches of water. Well, we can convert from atmospheres to heights of liquids. Recall that thirty three point nine zero feet of water is one atmosphere. We can do that, convert to feet of water from atmospheres, and then we can convert from feet to inches. There are 12 inches per foot, and that works out to be 2.6 inches of water pressure. So the gauge pressure at this point is 0 0.0064 atmospheres. It's less than it was at the lower elevation, and that is 2.6 inches of water. So there we used a simplified form of Bernoulli's equation, the pressure depth equation, to calculate this, but nothing wrong with this, but it certainly was tedious. Wouldn't it be easier to simply say that if we're moving to an elevation that's two meters higher, what's the pressure difference? Why don't we just say, well, okay, so two meters of water and one atmospheric pressure, I love atmospheric pressure, it gives us easy conversions, is 10.33 meters of water, and that's 0. 1936 atmospheres. That was a lot easier than using the pressure depth equation, but the point here was just to illustrate where it comes from. Take a look at this second special case of Bernoulli's equation. When an open tank, tank is open on top, is draining, then both ends, top and orifice, are open to atmospheric pressure. In this case, the pressure term can be eliminated from either side. And we're left with rho GZ1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared, potential energy plus kinetic energy. At the top of the tank is equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy at the bottom of the tank. Again, we're neglecting friction. We'll deal with friction later. Now, further simplification. If the orifice is small, compared to the cross-sectional area of the tank that's draining under gravity, then the liquid level will fall slowly enough that the liquid speed at the top of the tank, V1, is essentially negligible. So picture that. You picture a very large container, maybe a carboy, 20-liter carboy in the lab, and you open the valve and you let water flow out. How quickly does the level drop in the big tank? Well, hardly at all. So to a reasonable approximation, we'll just say V1 is zero up here. When we do that, we can cross out the velocity term as well for V1. And now we're left with rho GZ1, potential energy term up here, is equal to rho GZ2, potential energy down here, plus its kinetic energy, one-half rho V2 squared. Let's rearrange this equation. We'll say one-half rho V2 squared is equal to rho GZ1 minus rho GZ2, so it'll be rho GZ1 minus Z2, or rho G delta Z. And if we solve this for velocity, what do we get? Well, let's try it. 
I have one half rho v2 squared is equal to rho g delta z. So v2 squared will be 2 rho g delta z over rho. Now we'll say v is equal to the root of 2 g delta z. Here it is. v is equal to the root of 2 g delta z. This is called Torricelli's theorem. So note that the speed, here it is, velocity, with which a liquid is discharged under gravity is actually the same as the speed of a falling body falling from rest from height h and is independent of the density, the density term is gone, of the object. Now this may not be apparent what I just said but I want to prove it to you. If you recall in introductory physics you may have seen this equation before. If all the kinetic energy of an object comes from its potential energy, in other words from letting it fall, then we can write the kinetic energy one half mv squared is equal to its potential energy mg delta h. I'll come back to this in a second, but take a look. Here's an experiment that you can conduct. Now I'm just kidding, don't keep me serious here. Take a bowling ball, stand on a tall building, hold it at rest. Okay. So v1 is equal to zero, it's not moving kinetic energy right now is still zero, it's not moving, and it has some potential energy owing to its elevation, we'll call it x. If you drop the ball from rest, it accelerates as it falls. Halfway to the ground, its potential energy will equal its kinetic energy, one half of whatever it was initially. The instant before the ball actually hits the ground, just the instant before, all of the potential energy is gone and has been converted to kinetic energy x. So the kinetic energy is equal to the potential energy that you started with neglecting friction. And this is the equation right here. All of the kinetic energy came from its potential energy. Let's solve for v squared and then for v. So I'll say v squared is equal to 2 times mgh, I'm just bringing these terms over, and divided by m, and therefore v is equal to the root of 2g, and this is delta h. And there it is, it's the same formula we had derived for our liquid flowing from this tank with an open lid under gravity. So it's a useful calculation. Now in fluid flow we're interested not just in velocity but also in flow rate, Q, and we know that Q is equal to A times V, so we can write this equation as Q is equal to A times root 2GH, and that's flow from an orifice under gravity. Let's try a problem, problem three. Calculate the flow rate at which water will leak through a hole one square centimeter in area at the bottom of an open tank which is filled to a height of three meters and that's water. One square centimeter is the opening area and the height is three meters. So I've drawn a, a diagram here. This is water and the height above the orifice to the surface of the liquid is three meters. Both ends are open to atmospheric pressure. And the area of the orifice here is one square centimeter. We should be able to calculate the flow rate of the liquid, regardless of what liquid it is. It's independent of density. We can write Q is equal to A times V. For velocity we can write 
root 2gh. I'm going to work in the CGS system and we can convert it later. The area of the orifice was given as one square centimeter. Two times the gravitational constant in the CGS system, 981 centimeters per second squared. And the height of liquid is three meters which in the CGS system would be 300 centimeters. Q evaluates to 767. Units will be cubic centimeters per second, which I can write as 0 0.77 liters per second. Now under the radical we have centimeters times centimeters which is centimeters squared divided by seconds squared. So the root of centimeters squared over seconds squared is centimeters per second, which is then multiplied by square centimeters to give us cubic centimeters per second. There's something else here that you probably should be wondering. In this calculation I used G in units of distance per unit time squared, centimeters per second squared. Normally we've used G as 981 dynes per gram, right? Force per unit mass. Can I substitute like that? Actually you can. I'll show you. What is a dyne? A dyne is a gram times centimeter per second squared, and if I then divide that by grams, mass cancelled, I'm left with 981 centimeter per second squared. So these two are actually equivalent, and you can use whichever one makes the calculations easier for you. Pretty neat, eh? Please look at page 103. So far we've looked at Bernoulli's equation where liquid was not moving, so we eliminated the velocity term. We also looked at a case where the pressure was equal at the top and the bottom of a tank, so we eliminated the pressure term. Here's the final consideration, what if the elevation is unchanged? We could eliminate the elevational term. That's what we have in this pipe. So the elevation is the same at the center of the pipe, whether it's in the wide section of pipe or in the constriction. So our equation becomes P1 plus one half rho V1 squared kinetic energy will be equal to P2 plus one half rho V2 squared. Now by convention, one always refers to the position in the orifice and two is the pipe. So I'll stay with that convention that's normally used. Pressure and speed are inversely related. As velocity increases through a constriction, then the pressure will decrease. Now you see this on this pipe. We have a pressure tap. Uh, that is, we tap a hole and attach a tube to it and the liquid in the pipe is allowed to rise. It will rise as high as the pressure pushes it. And you can see that as the fluid speeds up going through the constriction, well, there's less pressure here than in the wide section of pipe. So the difference in height in the manometer tubes is an indication of the difference in pressure at these two points. Notice here and here, these are at the same elevation in the tube. There's no difference in height, and therefore there's no difference in pressure between these two points, or negligibly so. But there certainly must be a difference in pressure between the constriction and the pipe because there's a difference in height of the manometer fluids. Velocity increases, pressure decreases. This relationship is responsible for such phenomena as lift on an airplane wing, the movement of sailboats at angles to the wind, the Venturi action in carburetors, 
Bunsen burners, paint sprayers, aspirators, also called nebulizers, in perfume bottles, and flame atomic absorption spectrometers. Bernoulli's principle is very applicable to us in the lab. All right, here's extra problem. Calculate the difference in height, the difference in height in centimeters of water in the pressure taps shown above when the velocity of water is 10 centimeters per second in a pipe, that would be here, with a diameter of 2 centimeters, which then constricts to a diameter of 1 centimeter, which would be here in the throat. We're going to do this in the CGS system. We should first rearrange this formula a bit so we can use it more easily. Now P2 is in the pipe, and that'll be greater than P1 in the throat, so I want delta P, I'm going to say P2, I'll bring this P1 over minus P1, so P2 minus P1 will be delta P, and then I'll bring 1 half rho V2 squared to the left, so that'll be equal to 1 half rho V1 squared minus 1 half rho V2 squared, and that'll look like this. P2 minus P1, that'll be delta P, that will allow us to calculate the difference in height in the manometer tubes is equal to one-half rho v1 squared minus one-half rho v2 squared. So we can rewrite that as delta p is equal to one-half rho v1 squared minus v2 squared. Now what you can't do, I've seen some students do this, they write delta P is equal to one-half rho V1 minus V2 squared, and that's not right. It's a math violation. Exponents are not distributed over addition and subtraction, only over multiplication and division. So this is a formula we can use to calculate the difference in pressure we have the density of the fluid and we have the velocities, or we'll get the velocities. I drew a diagram here, let's label it up. The throat is 1, the pipe is position 2. This is what we're trying to solve for, the difference in height, which is equal to the difference in pressure. We're told that V2 is 10 centimeters per second, and diameter 2 is given as two centimeters, and V1, well we don't know, we'll need that, and D1 is equal to one centimeter. So we're going to calculate delta P as one-half rho V1 squared minus V2 squared. We'll need V1, velocity 1 will be velocity 2 times some ratio of the diameters squared. Velocity 2 was given in, as 10 centimeters per second, and the two diameters were 2 centimeters and 1 centimeter. We know that V1 is greater than V2 because the pipe is narrower. That means V1 will be greater than V2 in the throat. So that's 2 centimeters over 1 centimeter. That's squared. 2 squared is 4. So that's 40 centimeters per second for V1 in the constriction. So we can write delta P is equal to one-half. And rho, I'm going to use the CGS system, is the mass density of water, is one gram per cubic centimeter. Then we have the two velocity terms. So V1 is 40 centimeters per second. And we're going to square that. minus V2, which is 10 centimeters per second, and square that. So 
So here we have 1600 centimeters squared per second squared minus 100 centimeters squared per second squared. That'll be 1500. Delta P is one half times one gram per cubic centimeter times 1500 centimeters squared over seconds squared. So the difference in pressure is equal to one half of 1500 is 750. Now what about these units? Grams times square centimeters over cubic centimeters per second squared. What is that? How is that a pressure unit? Well, it can be if we cancel one of the centimeters from numerator and denominator this would become square centimeters this would just be centimeters what would we have? we'd have 750 we'll have grams times centimeter per second squared divided by square centimeters which do you recognize that's dynes per square centimeter, right? So gram times centimeter per second squared is a dyne per square centimeter, which is a unit of pressure. Now we're asked to calculate this as centimeters of water, a height of a water column. So we're going to have to convert that to some standard atmospheric pressure unit and then go to water. I want to convert that, I think, to Pascal's newtons per square centimeter. Let's do that, and then from newtons per square centimeter, we'll go to height of water. So 750 dynes per square centimeter. I want to go to newtons per square meter. To do that, we're going to cancel out dynes and go to newtons, and we'll cancel out per square centimeters and go to per square meter. I don't know if you recall, but there are 10 to the 5 dynes in a newton, and there are 10 to the 4 square centimeters in a meter. So basically we're dividing by 10. This is then 75 newtons per square meter, which is a Pascal. Now, I'd like to then go from Pascals to meters of water. We can do that using atmospheric pressure. Recall that 101,325 pascals is atmospheric pressure and atmospheric pressure is 10.33 meters of water. So I want to go ultimately to centimeters. Why don't I just put in here 10.33 centimeters of water. And when I do that I get 0. 765 centimeters of water height, which is a really small height, right? That's less than one centimeter. But it's a small change in pressure, gives rise to a small change in water column. So the diameter only changed by a factor of two, the velocity by a factor of four. A small difference. This would be a good time to introduce the other common form of Bernoulli's equation that you'll probably like because it's even easier to use than the one we're using, if you can imagine that. The other form we commonly see is pressure as a height of liquid above a certain point. We'll call it H for height, H1, plus our elevation of the liquid, that's its potential energy, Z1, plus V1 squared over 2G equals H2 plus Z2 plus V2 squared over 2G. Now in this problem, since the elevation is constant, we can eliminate the elevation term and we'll rearrange this as... Now again, H2 is the pressure in the pipe which is greater than in the throat, so I'm going to say H2 minus H1 which is delta P is equal to 
and I'm going to therefore bring this velocity term to the left side that'll be v1 squared over 2g minus v2 squared over 2g and I can get a common denominator here it's equal to v1 squared minus v2 squared over 2g we already worked this out the difference in velocity squared was 1500 centimeters squared per second squared divided by 2 times the gravitational constant in the CGS system is 1 gram per cubic centimeter and that worked out to be 750 dynes per square centimeter which we then previously converted to other forms so there's another way you could calculate that using an easier form of Bernoulli's equation h1 plus z1 plus v1 squared over 2g is constant neglecting friction and this looks like a good place to stop this lesson on flow